Welcome to the Modern Athenas podcast with Sonia and Debbie, where we discuss how regular women became Athenas in their own time by working hard, persevering through the challenges in their lives, and contributing to a better world. This is podcast 23. Today, we are joined by a guest, Alexandra or Ali Thomes. Ali is Sonia's niece and an artist who enjoys drawing, painting, sculpting, and writing. She is about to enter her second year at St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota. Allie recently self-published a book of poetry entitled, If the Grass Can Hold Its Ground, So Can I, that addresses mental illness and other challenges faced by college women today, such as sexual assault. Her hope is that the unapologetic spotlight of her words on these issues that have been kept in the darkness for far, far too long can inspire dialogue and hope. Look for the link on our website to buy Allie's book. So Allie, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for your courage to come on to our podcast and sh to share your words and artistry with others. Well, thank you for allowing me to do that. It means a lot. And I'm excited that, um, Allie, I've, I've known you and your artistry for so long that I get to share it with our listeners as well. So what we'd like to do today is to read and discuss seven of the poems that we deeply connected with um, as, as, we read, as we read through your poetry and that you uh, you've said sort of summarize the issues that are important to you. So um, I think we're going to start with a beginner's guide to getting up in the morning. A beginner's guide to getting up in the morning. Step one, set five alarms the night before in five, 10 and 15 minute increments. Step two, silence them all. Step three, you've just slept through breakfast with your friend and your first class. You've done this every weekday for two weeks. Get it together. Step four, Begin the cycle of self-loathing. Step five, resign to the fact that you can't get any work done until you get three more hours of sleep. Settle back in. Step six, you're finally awake. Go on your phone for an hour. Rest your eyes. Step seven, get out of bed. You're supposed to have homework done now. Step eight, instead you watch Netflix and every new subscription YouTube video. Step nine, remember that you haven't eaten for 15 hours. Step 10, think about eating. Realize you're too tired to leave your room. Step 11. You've already missed all of your classes, so it's time to go back to bed. So, Allie, I, um, you and I chatted a little bit about just the, the genesis of this poem and, and uh, why you wrote it. Can you share a little bit about how it came to be? Yeah, so the actual idea for this poem came about from a book of prompts. And one of the prompts was, write a beginner's guide to getting up in the morning. And so I kind of set that prompt aside for a few weeks as something I just, I want to get to that, you know, and write about that at some point. And um, at one point, I just opened my computer and that prompt was there. And it was something, you know, that I'd been thinking about because the first semester of college, because this is a relatively new poem, was just super difficult in that it's just such a big change that it was kind of, it just made being kind of hard. Um, so all of those things are essentially true, not exactly, you know, in that order. Um, I did go to class sometimes, you know, um, but yeah, I just, uh, it was just coming from a lot of my real experiences in the new change of college. Well, and you know, I was, I was going to say, Ali, as, as I was reading through this, it's hard sometimes, you know, and there's just those days that are just difficult. Um, and I think everybody can kind of relate, you know, it's not every day. It's like, okay, I'm just going to get up and go to work and all or get up and go to school. And it's all going to be fine. I think that there are these days that everybody struggles with just to, you know, be able to make it through the day. And, you know, a lot of people will use the term, oh, I'm going to take a mental health day, but it's true, right? I mean, there are there are days or weeks um, that that just it's a real struggle. And so reading this, I was like, yes, this this is what happens, you know, and it's and then, you know, the day kind of ends and, and you didn't get anything done. But there's this hope that that tomorrow is going to just be this kind of this better day. Yeah. Yeah. And I felt like as I was reading it, you know, it's, it's very basic steps. It's very basic kind of things you're thinking about eating and sleeping. And but it, it had this uh, I had this feeling it um, it was very static as well as if you're kind of watching the movement uh, and the motion outside of where you are and, and you're just kind of seeing the day go by and you know all you can think about is these kind of basic needs and um so i think that that's that can feel very uh unsettling at times just because it's almost like you need something to 
I would I would think I, I would need something to kind of break me out of that cycle in a way and try to what's going to get me out of out of these steps and into the world that's kind of passing by at the moment. Yeah, precisely. Well, I think it's hard too because that that's something different for everybody, right? Like maybe it's a friend coming in, you know, taking you out for a meal, right? Maybe it's going to a movie. For other people, maybe it's going and getting a new book. Um, maybe it's going for a walk. But I think sometimes we presume that what works for us is going to work for somebody else. So I think it's also just being sensitive that, you know, you got, you got to figure out what is it that's going to work for that person, not what's going to work for you. Yeah. And it's also kind of something that um, proves that is kind of the fact that this isn't everybody's guide to getting up in the morning. And so therefore, you know, it's not going to be the same, um, the same thing that will get people out of bed or the same thing to, you know, end that, that static kind of feeling. So I think that that's illustrated kind of well in this, like you have to, you either identify with this or you don't, I feel. Well, and maybe it's a good prompt for all of us to kind of think through, like, what is our, you know, what is that, if we're really honest with ourselves, what are those thoughts that we think about when we wake up in the morning? Yeah. So let's move on to another poem. Uh, this one is called How's Tricks. And is there anything you want to share before you read it? Yeah, actually. Um, so this poem is about trichotillomania which is a type of OCD, and it's not a very glamorous disorder by any means, so therefore I think it's pretty underrepresented just in general. Um, trichotillomania forces one to pull out their hair, um, and you can't really do anything to stop yourself from doing that. Um, and then obviously it kind of um, leads to, like, pretty obvious like thinning of hair and things like that um and it was writing this poem was on uh for me personally it's kind of I need to come to terms with how hair is changing for me hair has always been a huge tool of expression for me and something that's super important to me um you know I've had my hair dyed since I was in sixth grade my hair has never not been dyed since then so it's always been like I have always been a person that's been able to be spotted by their hair and now I feel like that's a negative thing I don't want to be able to be spotted by my hair um, so I wrote this poem that I wanted to have kind of illustrate the um, frenziedness that comes with trichotillomania and um, when I first wrote this I posted it on my blog and it was then that I realized how important having a poem like this written is because somebody responded and they just said, thank you so much for writing this. And um, I didn't realize at first, you know, that that would be important for someone else to hear. But I realized having representation of such kind of like a dark and hidden sort of disorder is so um, powerful for a lot of people. So that's why I wanted to write it and I wanted to read it today. House Tricks. Trichotillomania is a breed of OCD, insidious as the reputation of a pit bull, almost invisible to the untrained eye as a chihuahua, small, though with a bark about as ear-piercing. The tritch of trichotillomania is pronounced trick. Trick or treat, trick of the light, trick of the mind, is it an April Fool's trick? If so, it's not a very good one. I've been waiting for it to end for months. Is it a trick of the eye? I don't think so. No matter how you squint your eyes or what light you look at me in, there will be a bald spot. There are no tricks here. A trick up my sleeve? The only thing on my sleeve is my heart and a hundred strands of hair. A box of tricks? God, it sure is a fucking circus over here. A bag of tricks? A bag of hair? No matter what's supposed to be in there, it will be filled with hair. A dirty trick. A dirty, rotten trick. Is it a survival skill? Trichotillomania? long lost in others and only recently rediscovered within me? Do I understand a truth subconsciously that I cannot fathom consciously? I wonder what my brain thinks pulling out all of this hair is accomplishing. Am I to collect these delicate, rejected strands of hair and build a nest? Compose a cushion? Knit a two-piece outfit? Am I meant to let it decompose into the salt of the earth and fertilize a future generation of pine trees? 
Does hair even decompose or fertilize? What is the hinted meaning behind this compulsion? It does the trick. It knows every trick in the book, every trick in the book to make me pull. It never misses a trick. You can't miss a trick. It's a bald spot now. One trick pony. Up to your old tricks. A turn of the trick, trick of the trade. Can't teach an old dog new tricks. You sure taught me. As you're reading that and you talked about the frenzied feel, it's kind of actually, in a, I felt a contrast to the the beginner's guide because that one was very kind of static and you're watching the motion go by. And with this one, it felt almost like, almost like a slow accelerating like whirlpool effect almost. Like you're trying to grasp for meeting, you're trying to grasp for a reason why, or a, you know, why, and, and also just kind of, there's a lot of motion to it. There's a lot of repetition of the words. And uh, I, th I think that that frenzied nature really came across very well. Well, and I was just going to say, yeah, I, I think that that frenzied, I think it's hard to describe that in words, right? And so I think that that happens with a lot of mental illnesses, that that frenzy. And you've done a, you've done a great job capturing it. Um, and I think, you know, in so many people want to know, well, what does that feel like? Um, and, and we read this book called The Center Cannot Hold, and Ellen in places – describe that this this sort of frenzy that she feels with her schizophrenia and it is just very hard to describe and, and the sort of tempo and the, the pace and the rate that you read that it it describes what it what it is and so I think it was just it was beautiful um, and you know this inability to to be able to tell people this is what it is right um, without that sort of intonation and that pace and that rate um, and, you know, just, just reading it on a page doesn't do it, but the way that you read it out loud definitely does. Thank you. So next we want to talk about uh, one of your poems called No Rest Without Love. Mm -hmm. So, um, Ali, this is one that really touched me. So I was just wondering, um, before you read it, is there sort of any thoughts that you wanted to share? Sure. Um so the line, no rest without love, actually comes from a different poem that I had read. And um, it was just a line that stuck out to me. And it kind of made me want to dig deeper in, into that thought. And so um, kind of like I did with Beginner's Guide, I kind of took this line and put it to the side for later. And I came back to it and I just, I wanted to write something positive. Um, and I think it was at a time when I wasn't really feeling any of this. I wasn't really feeling the love and I had to sit down and think there has to be a time, you know, there is no rest without love and I need to I need to internalize that and I just tried to turn that into some words that I could um, use to comfort myself. No rest without love. If you ever think you feel no love, remember that there is no rest without love. A love of the night, a love of the warmth of sleep, a love of the day that follows, yes, there really is a love there. There must be something about tomorrow that you love, for you fall asleep today. You love yourself enough to rest when you need rest. You love her enough to rest when you need to for her sake. Or there's a love for your dreams, for the fullness you feel only when you're not awake. There is no rest without love. No matter how empty or dark you think you are, you can still love. There is always room for love. And, you know, Ali, um, one of the things that, you know, Sonia and I have talked about before is this sort of dichotomy between light and dark. Uh, and, you know, when, when you read that and when I read it, it made me think of that a little bit. And the fact that love is this sort of light and this, this bright that shines through the darkness and that it's no matter how dark how dark, right? And you say that at the very end of the poem, right? No matter how empty or dark you think you are, there is still love. There is, there's always sort of that light. Yeah. And so I just, I, I think about that and, you know, for, for people who suffer or who are embraced with the darkness right now, right? There's, there's always that little bit of light. Yeah. Even if it's just moments, you know, even if it's just like flickering, it's always kind of there. You can always kind of find it. Yep. Well, and I really liked the, just the idea of how in there's a love for your dreams for the fullness you feel only when you're not awake and so if you think about what it feels to be like in a a dream that is not a nightmare it's kind of this strange 
obviously otherworldly feeling and you wake up and um, it, it's it's just it's it's almost like you have to remind yourself that uh, you know that this other world exists and it's almost as if like you were talking about you had to remind yourself that this love and this light existed even though you weren't necessarily feeling it um, I thought this was a very honest and like tone to the poem and also it just kind of it, especially on the heels of and I know we we picked different poems and we're reading them back to back but the there's not a frenzied nature to this at all it's very kind of settling in and and kind of um really trying to almost like a, a, like trying to center towards this word love well and, and you know yeah and Sonia I think you make a good point right I think sometimes you have to remember that there is love and you have to remember that there is light. And I, I think it's, it's hard, right? Sometimes you're like that darkness just envelops you so much that it's hard to remember. And, and you know, Ali, you were saying that there, there are those, you got to glomp onto those, you know, one bright moment of, of light. Um, but, you know, it, it does get very difficult. And so I think this just really speaks to that, those, those moments of opportunity, you know, and those just little, those little, seconds those little moments that you can that you can kind of see your way out yeah so Allie uh let's move on to another poem this one sure. you've ent entitled the tango misogyny what can you tell us about it um this poem was um well just for the readers just to note this poem um does uh talk about sexual misconduct um and this poem it just um, is illustrating my frustration with the culture that we have um, that kind of expects sexual assault to be um, a part of life, to be kind of a coming of age story, you know? The fact that, that it's something that people just expect to happen, especially when they go away to college. I, you know, I, there's, I mentioned in here that just, one of my teachers, she just tried to prepare us for it. And it was just the frustration that came with knowing that this is something that was going to happen. And the fact that I was able to see people affected by it was just so frustrating to me. And I just wanted to um, be able to express that. The Tango Misogyny. I've always been told that I can be whatever I want to be if I put my mind to it. I've been told, don't become a statistic. Don't become a statistic. As if I can be whatever I want to be and I would choose to be a statistic. As if anybody does. I came home for Thanksgiving to my friends, women who go to college in different schools in different states. Nobody chooses to be a statistic. Every one of these friends can share a story of assault from just this past semester. But we are told, don't become a statistic, as if we are the ones who have normalized this assault so much that our assaulters could become president of the country. My English teacher, senior year, wanted the girls in the class to make sure a sexual assault hotline was programmed into our phones. We are told not to become a statistic while men sit idly by free of the blame of grabbing us. If the president can do it, why can't I? It takes two to tango, but what if I never learned to dance? I've been told I can be whatever I want to be if I put my mind to it. So I've chosen not to be a statistic. The trouble is, it seems that that is not my choice to make. So, Allie, um, when you're reading this, it's... it's you know, it, I think it's this trouble of, you know, you don't have the full control over what someone else is going to do. And that was one thing that struck me. And, and I, I was, I was curious, was, were the men or the boys, whichever you want to refer them to in college being um, told anything about this? Or was it really all being directed to the, to the, to the women? It was, um, I'd never heard, a, you know, when I was in college, I don't recall actually they're even being talk about sexual assault hotlines necessarily and that doesn't mean that it wasn't happening it just means it wasn't talked about at least where i was right well the interesting thing was um in this senior english class that i just um spoke about we had just watched um 
a bit of a documentary and had a presentation about sexual assault on college campuses. And the people that were leading this discussion were making a point that, um, you know, men need to be aware of their actions. They need to take responsibility. And it was just interesting that at the end of the presentation, what my teacher said to us was, great, now women put in this um, assault hotline. And it was just such a, a different tone than the presentation had taken. So it was something that the boys were told about. They were told about that moments earlier, but then it was kind of the onus was still on us. Um, and then before we, uh, before my year at college, um, it was mandatory for us to take or to do this little online um, activity. And half of it was, you know, careful drinking and half of it was um, being able to identify sexual assault. And it was mandatory for everybody um, who, who comes into college. So to some degree, everyone's aware of what's happening on campuses. But beside that one mandatory um, sort of online thing you do in the summer, I haven't really heard much about it on campus. Mm, I see. So there's not necessarily any follow up, I guess. Not other than much. This, yeah. I see. So the your friends that you came home to, you know, they you said they had similar stories to each other, and it, what were the messages or kind of the equivalent of program this hotline into your phone? Did they have similar things told to them? Um. See, the thing is, it's kind of. Part of the frustration was that it was so normalized that um, none of my friends had, um, it wasn't something that they had gone to anybody about, not, uh, not everybody had, um, because it was kind of just little things that are just so ingrained in um, the rape culture that men think that they are allowed to kind of, I don't know exactly the word I'm looking for, but they think that they're allowed to kind of have... Um, control to a higher degree um, of someone else's body than they have at all. You know, they you don't have any control over somebody else's body. It's kind of I, it's like you just don't have control at all over somebody else and kind of just what I was hearing and what I hear from people all the time is just a complete lapse in that acknowledgement on the part of of men and they just seem to not realize this or just not care if that makes sense it's an interesting discussion because i went to an all-women's college which mm -hmm. is very much about empowerment um and not victimization um and so it's just it's the literally the opposite conversation um so this is it's just really interesting it's very interesting yeah so, Ali, um, I want to move on to talk about two of the um, poems you wrote that kind of tied together. Um, and, and, you know, you can talk a little bit. It'll be uh, great to hear about sort of how they tie together. Um, and it's Long Live Lexapro and 2F. Um, and so maybe it'd be good before we start to sort of talk about how they, they tie and then we can um, kind of go, I guess, go through them one by one or, or however, you know, you would sort of like to approach it. Sure. Um, so Long Live Lexapro was a poem that I wrote in 11th grade and then updated in 12th grade and then updated again um, this winter. And it kind of summarizes each year in my life from 6th grade until this year and um, kind of has landmark has landmarks of important mental health aspects of myself um, in each year. And the poem 2F is a poem that I wrote to um, a friend that I mentioned two times in Long Live Lexapro. And this one was um, a poem that I wrote directly to her. So I can just read Long Live Lexapro and then go straight into 2F and then I can elaborate a little bit more on that afterwards. That'd be great. Okay. <clears throat> Long live Lexapro. Sixth grade. My best friend is signed into a mental hospital. I don't see her for two weeks. 
She tells our peers she's had the flu. Seventh grade. I've begun my second book. Halfway through, I realize I may be what the television shows call depressed. Eighth grade. My mother sees a fine collection of red line behind bars of multicolored bracelets. She tells me I shouldn't have to do that. She doesn't bring it up again. Ninth grade. My friend from sixth grade tells the school psychologist she's scared for me. They send me to a hospital for a mandatory psyche valve. My father almost cries. I sit on the hospital bed parked in the hallway draped in two hospital gowns. How long? Three, four, five, seventeen phantom voices ask. Two years, I tell the wall. My mother gasps in my periphery. I guess she never figured. My school psychologist sits beside me, too positive, too many smiles. My middle school guidance counselor has given me a small pillbox of Guatemalan worry dolls, hoping maybe next time I'll tell the dolls my problems. My mother smiles when I look at her, and when she thinks I'm not, she looks sadder than anyone I've ever seen. I've never thought her eyes could be that sad. My phone is dead. I wish I were. A male doctor sits diagonally from me. Too close for comfort, I want to push him away. How are you? I want to die. The words rip from my throat like I'm starting a rusted chainsaw. I've never felt this way before. His smile fades. Okay. He gets on with his questions. I get sent to group therapy. One of my therapists go to my church. I see her every Sunday. Tenth grade. My friends are gone. My medication makes me worse. My medication has changed. I still want to die. My therapists fall asleep when I speak, so I don't. Eleventh grade. Sometimes I'm okay, but only when I remember to medicate. I don't. When I don't, I become someone that scared me even on TV. I have no therapist. I have some friends. My psychiatrist doesn't listen to me. I'm scared every day. I don't know what to expect. I don't know how to get out of bed. I don't know how I'll get through the year. I've already lived longer than I ever thought I would. Twelfth grade. Things aren't awful. I take my medicine. I go to school. I come home. I sleep. I have friends. Friends that love me. I get into college. I turn 18. I'm alive. God, I'm alive. College first year. Feels like I've clamored into a time machine back to 8th grade. I'm not okay. I'm striped. Black and blue and red all over. But God, I make the best friends in the world. My therapist says she'd rather I call 911 than talk to my friends. I have an anxiety attack in class every single day. I see him staring at the cuts on my shoulder. I am nothing more than my aching. But God, I'm fucking trying. 2F I would like to thank you quite sincerely for saving my life. I know I will not thank you for this tomorrow, nor do I fully want to thank you for it now, but I know some day when I'm thinking about the walls in the hospital and the man who is next to me and the man down the hall from me, I will thank you, quite sincerely and from the very bottom of my heart, for saving my life. All right, so Allie, raw and true. I mean, I, your bravery in writing this, um, this is what it's like. This is what it's like to fight day after day with mental illness. And, you know, I, I, you know, I bring up the center cannot hold again. And, you know, we, we listen to Ellen, but this, this is, this is raw and, and true. Um, and, you know, I just, um, you know, hearing it and I, you know, our listeners who, who are out there listening, you know, this is, this is what it's like for people who suffer. And it's not one day, it's not one week. It's not that you get on medication and it's suddenly all better. No, this is, this is what it's like. Well, Allie, what really struck me about um, long, li- long Live Lexapro is there's no, like, extra words. It's like, it's, it's like you've only c- brought it down to express just the very core of what, and, I, and I, I can only imagine that those words don't even come close to truly expressing all that they're meant to represent on the page, but... I feel like because it's kind of everything else is stripped away and it's very s- simple language in a way that it really grabbed grabbed my attention because I think we're used to in this world um, 
things can get very flowery, things can get very exaggerated, especially, you know, on social media and Instagram, and you know, everyone wants to put forth their, their best and sparkliest. And, and so when that's not there, it's actually, I felt like it really has a a, a strong, it's a tension getter. That's what it just, it grips you. That's what I, I think I, I meant to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, to F, I just wanted to um, note that I wrote this in ninth grade, um, shortly after, you know, all this happened. And um, when I first wrote the poem, I used my friend's name um, in in the title instead of just the letter F. And I never intended to show this poem to her or to anyone. Um, But when I was putting together this little chapbook, it felt right to put it in. And um, when I finally got my copy of my book in the mail, I actually, I wasn't sure if I should send my friend a picture of this poem or kind of just like see if she finds out that it's in there somehow. Um, So I sent her a Snapchat and I, it was just a picture of the poem and the caption was something like, so you're in my book or something like that. And um, I saw that she took a screenshot of it and she said something like, I'm really glad I can be your muse or like, and I'm glad that, you know, all this happened. And it was kind of just a really short um, exchange. But my friend um, who this poem is about, she she actually passed away uh, very recently on June 13th. And it just made me so glad that I could um, share this poem with her. And it made me... um, I'm just, I'm really glad that I ended up putting it in the book because I wasn't sure if I should at first. And I'm definitely really happy that she was able to see her impact because it's very strong, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because I would, I would say to people like never hesitate to reach out and help, you know, because it's, it's, it's one of these things where, um, you know, you, you, I think it's difficult to reach out and I think it's hard because you don't know what to say and you don't know what to do and you're like, oh, am I going to say the right thing? Am I going to make it worse? Am I going to, um, you know, are they going to be angry with me? And I, you know, at some point, at some search, at some situations, better to risk that, you know, better to risk that they're going to be angry with you, that they're going to want to, you know, walk away. They're not going to want to talk to you for a while then, um, then not to step in and, and do anything. So, you know, it's, it's just sort of the, I don't know. I would just urge people to take that step um, and to care enough to engage. I completely agree. Well, and I think, you know, talking about Ellen Sachs again, which was a really um, impactful book for me, I, th- I feel like Ellen's honesty with, about her, her life, uh, you know, really drew me to compassion for anyone and everyone that obviously deals on a daily basis, an hourly basis of every minute basis um, with mental illness. And because she, her, her whole plea was to see the humanity in all of us. And I, I found that that had a natural draw to compassion. And so I, I thought it was also interesting along that line. You don't necessarily say what at, F did for you, but it's clear that whatever she did, um, it had a very, you know, loving, it, it, it came across as a very loving and um, selfless act or just presence or um, friendship, whatever it may have been, but you don't, you almost don't have to say the details of it. The impact is very clear. Yeah, it was yeah, she's very selfless. And it was, you know, she, this poem also just kind of epitomizes like who she was as a person. She was just always just, let me just go save your life real quick. All right, cool. (laughs) Which is, so I, I, yeah, this poem means a lot to me as well. And, And I'm glad that, you know, I don't need too many words to get my point across with it. So we're gonna move to one more poem, uh, the gospel of the sun. And, uh, what is there anything you want to share with us before you read it i wrote this one at a little lake um at my college and in the book there's a picture of the lake right beside this poem and um i was just listening to the sounds and i just started writing in my sketchbook and um this is what came of it 
the gospel of the sun. Cacophony, cacophony, nature's cacophony, devout in its cry, overcome by the gospel of the sun. Loons throw their heads back, frogs close their eyes, and the music just comes, in effortless canon. A cacophonous choir of marimbas. Echoes. From the east, a cry. From the west, a response. Even the cars on the distant highway join the grass and the trees, humming and swaying. Reeds bowed in reverence to the orchestra, the symphony, the choirs around them. A hand holds a bat, hits a ball somewhere. A metallic din not unlike that of the brown bird beside it. Holy vibrations grip the whole pond. Cacophony. Careful cacophony. So, Allie, I can't help but just smile. Like, with this poem, I, I'm not sure. It, it just has that effect. It's so genuine and joyous, and you can really, you really transport us to the la that lake that you're talking about. Yeah, I was smiling the whole time I was reading it. <laughs> I could hear it then. <laughs> it's just, there's something just so peaceful about it, you know, and just so serene. And, and in the midst of all of these, you know, phrenic moments and really emotional moments and all of this turmoil, there's just something, just this little dichotomy of this just very serene lake um, and your ability to just feel that um, through this poem. It's, it's beautiful. Thank you. So, Ali, uh, as we mentioned earlier on this podcast, we discuss how regular women become Athenas by working hard, persevering through the challenges in their lives, and contributing to a better world. And we think you are a modern Athena by those standards, absolutely. So uh, we'd like to ask you a couple um, quick response questions. You don't have to respond quickly, but just kind of a, we have about four or five questions that we'd just like to uh, ask you right now. Okay. So what is something that you are currently working hard at? Currently, I am working hard at being okay and doing the things that I enjoy, like painting and drawing and writing. Hmm, so like kind of carving out that time for yourself in a sense? and Yeah, totally. I'm just, I'm trying to reconnect with the things that have always made me a better person and made me feel better. And I'm just trying to bring that back into my everyday um, sort of routine. Mm. So what is a challenge that you are currently up against or have recently overcome? Um, being okay is also something that I'm, that is challenging me. And it's a challenge just because I never know what is going to come my way, um, just in, in terms of my emotions changing quickly or the things that upset me changing. Um, and that is a challenge for me. And what's also a challenge for me is thinking forward to my future after college. And I'm only going into my sophomore year, but I still don't know what I want to do with myself. So that is a challenge that I'm just trying to be okay with not knowing what I'm going to do. That is great advice for all of us. And <laughs> um, I went through six years of college and, you know, still didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. And I'm sure that there are still going to be points in life for all, each of us that will kind of be at those crossroads. Um, but along those lines, I, I was just curious if you have any advice for young men and women who are navigating life just like you. Yeah, you know, I think you think what I would say to anybody who has a mental illness is that it sucks and it's going to suck, but it's also going to be okay, um, at least sometimes. And there are people that care about you, even when it feels like there are not, and like people that want to be there for you. And I know it's it's super hard to feel that sometimes, but they're there and um going off of kind of what we were saying earlier about 2f and long live lexapro i think that it's really important that if you are you know on the outside and you see somebody struggling i think stepping in somehow is super important and powerful and something that um i feel like 
people should do if they feel comfortable with that. And you don't always have to be able to help people. Uh, you can just be there for them. You don't have to solve their problems, if you know what I mean. And mm. um, I think also just realizing that mental illnesses are way more common than I think some people realize. So if you're on the outside, you know, perhaps um, just be cognizant of the fact that people around you could be struggling and maybe keep an eye out for that. And if you yourself are struggling, be aware that you're not alone, which is also, you know, it's, it's super hard to just say that. Well, it's easy to say that rather. It's super easy to just say that, but to believe that and to, to internalize that is definitely super hard. But, you know, if anybody with a mental illness, like, if you just hear that, just know that there are people that care and it's all, it's all going to be good, you know? So uh, I would, we would love to get your contact information out there when, um, and when we post this podcast uh, on our Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, uh, we'll link to any social media that Allie has. So if you want to reach out to her, um, if Allie, if you're willing, you know, we'd love to be able to connect you to our listeners and, and anyone who might want to talk with you further about any of that. For sure. And Allie, we just really thank you for coming on and being brave and sharing all of this really personal um, and intimacy with all of our listeners and with us. Thank you so much for allowing me to do that and being open to that. And on that note, that's all we have for today. So thanks again to Allie um, for sharing her beautiful words with us. And thanks to our listeners for sharing this experience with us. You can interact with us and learn about upcoming episodes by following us on Facebook under Modern Athenas, on Twitter at Modern Athenas, or on Instagram at the Modern Athenas Podcast. We'd also appreciate if you support our podcast by leaving us a review on iTunes or Stitcher and subscribing to the podcast. In our next podcast, we'll be discussing the book Canyon Solitude by Patricia C. McCarran. As we leave you today, we want to remind you to never forget that each of you, like all the modern Athenas we have discussed in our podcasts, has the power and capacity to be a change maker in your world. Work hard, dream big, and reach for the stars.